Good evening. This is Peter Tobin introducing... Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theatre presents, for your entertainment, the finest in radio drama. This week we present The Sound of Murder by Donald Westlake. Amy Thornbridge Walker is a little girl. Abraham Levine is a detective. When a little girl tells a middle-aged detective with heart trouble that her mother has murdered her stepfather by making a loud noise at him, what must a middle-aged detective with heart trouble do? Listen in a few moments to The Sound of Murder, adapted and produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael McCabe. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, The Sound of Murder. Tonight's? Huh? A paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Take it. Take it. Oh, well, thanks. So Pope John the Twelfth was the first prelate of the Roman Catholic Church to smoke cigarettes in public. <laughs> well, that's just great. conspires against a man who tries to give up smoking. All around me, day by day, people puff at cigarettes. They don't make any fuss about it. They just smoke cigarettes. If I isolated myself against the smokers of the world, cigarette commercials on radio and television would drive me mad. The most popular sentence in all fiction is, he lit another cigarette. Statesmen, entertainers, all of them, all smoking. Whenever news photographers snap them for posterity. Quiet tonight. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, being a cop is the most exciting thing in the world, Abe. You know that? What? Oh. Come along to Brooklyn's 43rd Precinct, folks. Thrill a minute. Ugh. I'm going to the John. Who knows? I might find a body in there. Yeah, cockroach. <laughs> <sighs> oh, yes. Sure, that is nice. That is very nice. The governor... Cigarette in FDR cigarette holder at a jaunty angle in his mouth. Oh, you're beautiful, Governor. The whole world. A grown man who tries to give up smoking is as a comic character. A Robert Benchley or a W.C. Fields bubbling along, plagued by trivia, life an endless gauntlet of minor... Crises. Mm, they could do a one reeler on me, a great little comedy. Laurel without Hardy. Hardy died of a heart attack. Abram Levine, 53 years of age, 24 years a cop, eight years into the heart attack range. When I go to bed at night, I keep myself awake listening to the silence that replaces every eighth or ninth beat of my heart. When I climb stairs or do anything strenuous, those missed heartbeats come closer together. Every seventh, then every sixth, then every fifth. One day, my heart will skip two beats in a row. And then, 
And on that day, Detective Abraham Levine will stop. Because there won't be any third beat. None at all. Not ever. Huh? Huh? Oh, uh... It's first sign, you know, Abe. First sign? What of? <laughs> Nuts. Talking to yourself. Well, I, I didn't hear you. Come come in. C c come back. Heart? Yeah. Uh, I know a dozen guys with a heart that's kind of suspect. Uh. Yeah. What does is, what is the doc think? Well, I, I, I went to him. Four months ago, he checked me over. <laughs> Felt like an old auto brought to a mechanic or a boat. You know, a boat its owner wanted to know whether it was worth fixing or not. Or just junk that ought to be replaced. <whistles> like it, it might have been necessary to get a new model. The house next door to mine, a baby cries every night. The new model crying for the old, the obsolete to get off the road. Well, you've got a little skip in your heart. Lots of people have that, Abe. Yeah, that's what the doctor said. Blood pressure's a bit high, too, but... I paid the doctor his fee, but I'm kind of unconvinced. He said if I really wanted to do something for my heart, I could cut out the smoking. I haven't had a cigarette since. And? I understand for the first time in my life how those junkies we lock up feel. I'm ashamed of myself, becoming so dependent. But I'm going to make it. Yeah. How about uh, turning the fan off? Cool enough. Yeah. Why can't the phone ring? Something. Now I'm trying to smoke a pencil. Come in. What? Someone at the door. Oh. Push! May I come in? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, come on in. Uh, sit over here. Uh, you care for a cigarette? Uh, no, Jack, she's, uh... I want to talk to a detective. Are you a detective? Yes, I am. My name is Amy Thornbridge Walker. I live at 717 Prospect Park West, apartment 4A. I want to report a murder, a quite recent murder. A murder? My mother murdered my stepfather. She's a nut. Hear her out and she'll go home. Uh, tell me about it. Uh, when, when did it happen? Two weeks ago, Thursday, November the 27th, at 2.30 p.m. Uh, what's your mother's name? Gloria Thornbridge Walker. And my stepfather was Albert Walker. He was an attorney. Uh, was your father's name Thornbridge, is that it? Yes, Jason Thornbridge. He died when I was very small. I think my mother killed him, too, but I'm not absolutely sure. <clears throat> I see. But you are absolutely sure that your mother killed Albert Walker? My stepfather, yes. My first father was supposed to have drowned by accident in Lake Champlain, which I consider very unlikely, as he was an excellent swimmer. Uh... How, how long have you thought that your mother killed your re, uh, your first father? I'd never thought about it at all until she murdered my stepfather. Naturally, I then started thinking about it. <coughs> Did, um, <coughs> he die of drowning too? No, my stepfather wasn't athletic at all. In fact, he was nearly an invalid for the last six months of his life. Then, uh, how... Did your mother kill him? She made a loud noise at him. I can't stay any longer. I stopped here on my way home from school. If, if my mother found out that I knew and that I told the police, she might try and murder me, too. 
I am not a silly little girl. And I am not telling a lie or making a joke. My mother murdered my stepfather, and I came in here and reported it. That's what I'm supposed to do. You aren't supposed to believe me right away, but you are supposed to investigate and find out whether or not I've told you the truth. My stepfather was a very good man. My mother is a bad woman. She came in to report a murder. Her mummy killed her daddy by making a great big noise at him. Come again? Well, uh, check it out. Yeah, you do that. Kids come in here, they, they find dead bodies in alleys, and they see flying saucers on rooftops. They report counterfeiters in basement apartments, uh, kidnappers in black trucks. <laughs> at one time, in a thousand, what a child reports is real and not a product of a young imagination. She did come up here as a joke. A bet, say. Oh, she's a fine little actress. Though, how can I tell? I haven't got any children. It's not easy to, uh, communicate with the very young. Her mommy killed her daddy by making a great big noise at him. Yeah. Uh, how many shopping days to Christmas, Jack? <laughs> So? November 28th, obituary notice on Albert Walker. Cause of death, a heart attack. The mortician was Julius Merriman. The doctor was Henry Sheffield. Just been talking to Sheffield. Yes, so I got it. You heard then? Well, how could I hear Sheffield's part of it? My ears aren't that big. So? Well, he said it was heart failure, pure and simple. Can't understand why the police should be interested in the case. Neither can I. Sheffield said that Walker had suffered a coronary attack about seven months ago. The second attack was more severe, and he hadn't really recovered from the first. He seemed a bit put out about me calling him. He seemed to think I was implying a number of things. I don't know. He wasn't Mrs. Walker's first husband's doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I... I leaned back too far that time. I... Don't... do that. Every sixth beat. The sixth. Need a cigarette. Need one more than I've ever needed one before. Jack, uh, do you have a cigarette? I, I thought you were giving them up. Uh, not around here. Please, Jack. attack. She made a loud noise at him. The second attack was more severe, and he hadn't recovered from the first. It was every sixth beat there for a while, after the loud noise of Crawley's backward dive. Did Gloria Thornbridge Walker really kill Albert Walker? Will Abraham Levine really kill Abraham Levine? Huh? Huh? I, I, I thought you said something. No, I, I, I didn't say anything. Well, you changed your mind. What? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'll ever smoke again. Mm. Peg, 
I got a problem. A problem? If you're coming to me, it must be awful. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's not every night of the year. Not every night I talk over problems with my wife, I know. Oh, younger men I know discuss everything with their wives. But me? Well, I'm a product of an older upbringing. I still believe women should be shielded from the more brutal aspects of life. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> That's your problem. Don't feel lonely, Abe. It happens to all kinds of people. Have some more gravy. Oh, let me tell you. A little girl came in today. She was maybe 13 years old. She was dressed nicely, polite, very intelligent. She wanted to report that her mother had killed her stepfather. A little girl? A thing like that? No, wait, let me tell you. I called the doctor and he said it was a heart attack. The stepfather, Mr. Walker, he'd had one attack already. The second one on top of it killed him. But the little girl blames the mother. Psychological, you think? I don't know. I asked her how her mother had done the killing and... She said her mother had made a loud noise at her father. A joke. These children today, I don't know where they get their ideas. All this on the TV. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Man with a bad heart, bedridden, invalid, sudden shock, a loud noise. Uh, it might do it. Bring on that second attack. What else did the little girl say? That's all. Her stepfather was good, and her mother was bad. And she'd stopped off on her way home from school. She only had a minute because she didn't want her mother to know what she was doing. You let her go? You didn't question her? I didn't believe her. You know, the imagination children have. But now? Now, I don't know. Now, there's two questions in my mind. First, is the little girl right or wrong? Did her mother actually make a loud noise that killed her stepfather or not? And if she did, then question number two, did she do it on purpose or was it an accident? You see, maybe the little girl is right and her mother actually did cause the death, but not intentionally. If so, I, I don't want to make things worse for the mother by dragging it out in the open. Maybe the little girl is wrong altogether. And if so, it would be best to just let the whole thing slide. But maybe she's right. And it was murder. And then the, you know, the, the child's in danger. Because if I don't do anything, she'll try some other way. And the mother will find out. I don't like that, a little girl like that. Could she defend herself? A woman to kill her husband, a woman like that could kill a child just as easy. Huh? I don't like that at all, Abe. Yeah, neither do I. question is, what do I do? A child like that. A woman like that. Huh? And then again, maybe not. For right now, you eat. It's here. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I got to thinking about it myself last night. We ought to check it out. I know. I figure I ought to look up the death of the first father. 
Jason Thornbridge, wasn't it? Good. I was thinking of going to a school, talking to a teacher. She's the kind of child who makes up wild stories all the time. Then, well, that's that. You know what I mean. Yeah, sure. You know what school she's in? Uh, Lathmore Elementary over on 3rd. she tell you that? I didn't hear it if she did. Uh, no, she didn't, but it's the only one it could be. <laughs> I'm pulling a Sherlock Holmes. She told us she stopped in on our way from school. She was walking home. And there's only three schools in the right direction. So we'd be between them and Prospect Park. But they're close enough for her to walk. There's St. Aloysius, but she wasn't in school uniform. There's PS 118, but with a Prospect Park West address and the clothing she was wearing and her good manners, she doesn't attend a school like that. So that leaves Lathmore. Okay, Sherlock. You go talk to the nice people at Lathmore and I'll dig into the Thornbridge thing. One of us ought to check this out with the lieutenant first. Tell him what we want to do. Fine. Go ahead. Uh, Jack, I, I think maybe you ought to be the one to talk to him. Why me? Why not you? Oh, I think he has more respect for you. What are you talking about? No, I mean it. If I tell him, I think he'd think I was dramatizing or getting emotional or something, and he'd say thumbs down. But you're the level-headed type. If you tell him it's serious, he'll believe you. You're nuts. You are the level-headed type, and I am too emotional. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. All right, go to school. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. to check it out. It might help if we knew a little more about her, what her attitudes are, things like that. Yes, uh, about this report she made yesterday, you see. Yes, but what sort of report? Something about this school? Oh, no, no, not at all. Oh, her name? Uh, Amy Walker, Amy Thornbridge Walker. Oh, yes. Amy came to you yesterday. Oh, that's right. Well? You see, I, I want to know what kind of child she is and... Um, well, anything else you can tell me about her? Well, I can tell you she's a brilliant and a well-brought-up child. I can tell you that she's the one I picked to be student in charge while I came here to talk to you. That she's always at least a month ahead of the rest of the class in reading the assignments. And that she's the most practical child I've ever met. Her father died two weeks ago, didn't he? Oh, that's right. How did they get along, do you know, uh, Amy and her father? Oh, she worshipped him. He was her stepfather, as a matter of fact. Amy doesn't remember her real father... Mr. Walker was the only father she knew. Having been without one for so long, well, it was important to her. She took his death hard. Oh, she was out of school for a week. Inconsolable. She spent the time at her grandmother's, I understand. I believe the mother had a doctor in twice to her, uh, to Amy. Yes, her, her mother. Um, how do Amy and her mother get along? Normally, so far as I know. There's never been any sign of discord between them so far as I've seen. But my contact with Amy is limited to school hours, of course. You think there is discord? Oh, no. No, not at all. I didn't mean to imply that. Just that I, I couldn't give you an expert answer to the question. Mm. You're right. Is Amy a very imaginative child? Would you say? Well, she's very self-sufficient in play, if that's what you mean. I was thinking about storytelling. Oh, a liar. No. No, Amy isn't the tall talk type. A very practical little girl, really. Very dependable judgment. Yes, as I oh, say... I beg your pardon, Miss Haskell. Oh, no, not at all, Miss... Uh... I'm sorry. No, as I said, she's... She's the one... Amy's the one I left in charge of the class. Hmm. She wouldn't be likely to come to us with a wild story she'd made up by herself. Not at all. If Amy told you about something, it's... Well, it's almost certainly to be the truth. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Could you tell me what this wild story was? I might be able to help. I'd rather not. Not until we're sure, one way or the other. Well, if I can be of any assistance... Oh, thank you. You've already helped. Mm -hmm. 
You have all the luck, Abe. You missed the whirlwind. Whirlwind? Uh, Amy's mama was here. Dr. Sheffield called her about you checking up on her husband's death. And just before she came over here, she, she got a call from somebody at Lathmore Elementary saying there was a cop there asking questions about her daughter. She didn't like us casting aspersions on her family. Aspersions? Yeah, that's what she said. You're a little Sir Echo this morning, aren't you? I need a cigarette. What did the lieutenant say? She didn't talk to him. She talked to me. No, when you told him about the little girl's report. Oh. Yeah. Oh, he said it'd take a couple of days on it and then let him know how it looked. Fine. How about Thornbridge? Accidental death. The inquest said so. Uh-huh. No question in anybody's mind. He, he went swimming too soon after lunch, got a stomach cramp and drowned. What's the word on the little girl? Amy? Uh, her teacher says she's reliable, practical, realistic. She tells us something, that's the way it is. That isn't what I wanted to hear, Abe. Didn't overjoy me either. No, that isn't what I wanted to hear at all. Uh, what did the mother have to say? I had to spill it, Abe. Uh, but what her daughter reported. Well, that's okay. Now we've got no choice. We've got to follow through. What, uh, what was her reaction? She didn't believe it. She had to after she thought about it. Sure. Then she was baffled. She didn't know why Amy should say such a thing. Couldn't understand it. Was she home when her husband died? She says no. Uh, some... Somebody had to be with him all the time, but he didn't want a professional nurse. So when Amy came home from school that afternoon, the mother went to the supermarket. Her husband was alive when she left and dead when she got back. Or so she says. She says Amy was the one who found him dead? No, Amy was watching television. When the mother came home, she found him and called the doctor. Now, what about noises? She didn't hear any and can't understand what Amy means. All right. We've got one timetable discrepancy. Amy said her mother was at home and made a loud noise. The mother says she was out to the supermarket. After a lifetime of smoking, my hand just... <clears throat> That's tough. So? Yeah. What, um... What did you think of Mrs. Walker, Jack? She's tough. She was mad and she's used to having things her own way. Can't see her playing nursemaid. But she sure seemed baffled about why the kid should make such an accusation. I'll have to talk to Amy again. Once we've got both stories, we can see which one breaks down. Hmm. Yeah. Mm, I, I wonder... Oh, I, I'm sorry, Abe. Look, I'll... I'll... Mm. No, no, no. It's... It's, uh... it's been a lifetime for me, too. I, I can't. Sure, sure. Can't change a habit for me, Jack. Just sort of found myself watching you light that cigarette. <laughs> yes, I must see Amy again. I wonder if she'll try and shut the kid's mouth. Well, let's not think about that now. We've still got all day. You're going to phone the Walker's place? No, I'm going to call the school. I'll talk with Amy there. I'll ask that we're left alone. Ah. I'm sorry, Amy. I really am sorry. But you see, girl, we um, had no choice. Your mother had to know. I think it'll be all right. She wouldn't dare try and hurt me now with you investigating. It'd be too obvious. My mother is very subtle, Mr. Levine. You have quite a vocabulary. I'm a very heavy reader. I want to talk to you about the day when your father died. Your mother said she went out to the store, and when she came back, he was dead. Now, what do you say? Nonsense. I was the one who went out to the store. The minute I came home from school, she sent me out to the supermarket. But I came back too quick for her. Why? 
But just as I was coming down the hall from the elevator, I heard a great clang sound from our apartment. Then it came again as I was opening the door. I went through the living room, and I saw my mother coming out of my stepfather's room. She was smiling, but when she saw me, she suddenly looked terribly upset and told me something awful had happened. And she ran to the telephone to call Dr. Sheffield. She acted terribly agitated and carried on just as though she meant it, just as though she really meant it. And she fooled Dr. Sheffield completely. Why did you wait so long before coming to us? I didn't know what to do. I didn't think anybody would believe me. I was afraid if, if Mother knew what I knew and what I was going to do, she, she might try and do something to me. But Monday in civics, Miss Haskell was talking about the duties of different parts of government, firemen and, and policemen and everybody, and she said the duty of the police was to investigate crimes and see the guilty were punished. So yesterday, I, I came and told you because, well, it didn't matter if you didn't believe me. You'd have to do your duty and investigate anyway. All right. Well, we're doing that. But we need more than just your word. You understand that, don't you? We need proof of some kind. Yes. What store did you go to that day? A supermarket, the big one on 7th Avenue. Do you know any of the clerks there? Would they recognize you? I don't think so. It's a great big supermarket. I don't think they know any of their customers at all. Did you see anyone on your trip to the store or back that would remember that it was you who went to the store and not your mother? And that it was that particular day? I... No. No? I don't think so. I don't know any of the people in the neighborhood. Most of the people I know are my parents' friends or kids from school, and they live all over, not just around here. Oh, <clears throat> uh, well, we'll see what we can do. This clang you told me about, do you have any idea what your mother used to make the noise? No, I don't. I'm sorry. It sounded like a gong or something. I don't know what it could possibly have been. A tablespoon against the bottom of a pot? Oh. Something like that? Oh, no. Much louder than that. And she didn't have anything in her hands when she came into the bedroom? Uh, out of the bedroom? No. Nothing. Well, we'll see what we can do. You can go back to class now. Thank you. Thank you for helping me. It's my duty, as you pointed out. You'd do it anyway, Mr. Levine. You're a very good man. Like my stepfather. <clears throat> Yeah. More ways than one, maybe. Well, you go back to class. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, there's one thing I can't do for you. Now, uh, look. Um, <laughs> hope Mrs. Haskell doesn't mind me stealing a piece of paper from her pad. Now, look. This is the number of the precinct, and this is my home number there. Now, if you think there's any danger of any kind, any trouble at all, you can call me. At the precinct until four o'clock, and then at home after that. Oh, thank you. You are a very good man. A very, very good man. Hey, switch off that lousy fan, Jack. It's like Antarctic in here. You have a fan on to keep cool, and I wear a coat to keep warm. We were born for different worlds. So? Nothing. Same here. Not a thing. Sheffield says, in his opinion, that Amy's making the whole thing up. That her stepfather's death was a great shock, and all this is some kind of delayed reaction to it. Certainly, he won't admit any possibility that Mrs. Walker murdered her husband. Neither can he see any possible motive for such an act. Well, the only contradiction between both stories, Amy's and her mother's, is the bit about who went to the store the day Mr. Walker died. Find proof that either Amy or her mother's lying, and we'll have the full answer. Yes, but who saw them? One or both of them? Nobody. Who could possibly remember? I've asked until I'm sick of asking. Well, no one remembers. No one saw, no one knows anyone. It's a city of strangers we live in, Jack. Well, it's been two weeks. Their building has a doorman, but he can't remember that far back. He sees the same tenants go in and out every day. And he wouldn't be able to tell you for sure who went in or out yesterday, much less two weeks ago, he says. She's home from school now. I wonder what they're saying to each other. If we could listen in, we'd know a whole lot more than we do now. No. Whether she's guilty or innocent, they're both saying the same exact thing. The death's two weeks old. Oh, you're right, Jack. 
If Mrs. Walker did commit murder, she's used to the idea now that she's gotten away with it. She'll deny everything Amy says and try to... Convince the girl she's talking out of the back of her neck. Uh, the same things and the same words as if she were innocent. What if she kills the kid? She won't. If Amy were to disappear or to have an accident or be killed by an intruder, we'd know the truth at once. No, oh, she can't take the chance. With her husband, all she had to do was to fool a doctor who was inclined to believe her in the first place. Besides, the death was a strong possibility anyway. This time, she'd be killing a healthy 12-year-old. She'd be trying to fool a couple of cops who wouldn't believe her at all. Ah, oh, she's probably safer now than before she came to us. Who knows what the mother might have been planning up until now. All right, that's fine so far. But what do we do now? Tomorrow I want to take a look at the Walker apartment. But why not right now? No, let's give her a night to get rattled. Any evidence she hasn't removed in two weeks, she's unlikely to think of now. Oh, all right, I, I don't expect to find anything. I want to look at the place because I can't think of anything else to do. Sure. All we have is the unsupported word of a 12-year-old child. Yeah, the body can't tell us anything because there wasn't a murder weapon. Walker died of natural causes. Proving they were induced won't be the easiest thing in the world. If only someone had seen the kid at the grocery store. That's the only chink in the wall, Abe. The only place we can get a grip. We can try again tomorrow, but I doubt we'll get anywhere. Tomorrow, maybe lightning will strike. Well, oh, cab, please. Yes, uh, 312 Crossfield. Uh, Ridgeway, yeah. Huh? Yeah, urgent. Five minutes? Fine.
Prospect Park, West. Fourth floor. Why does the elevator have to be on the eleventh floor? It's quicker to... No, not me. As I left the house, that was the phone I heard. The phone! I'm too late. She's made a move already. I was too late when I left the house. Nothing. She heard me fall and she thinks I'm dead. That face? It was only phosphorescent paint on a balloon. A balloon pricked with a pin. The shriek? That probably came from a tape recorder. Full volume. My heart is weak, but not that weak. She tried to kill me. My heart's weak, but not as weak as Walker's still recovering from... It could kill Walker, the shock. But not me. No, Amy. It didn't work. Don't waste your time. If it didn't work at first when I wasn't ready for it, then it won't work at all. Your mother is dead. You killed her too. <clears throat> Your father and mother both. And when you called my home to tell me she'd killed herself, and my wife told you I had already left, you knew then that I knew. And you had to kill me too. I told you that my heart was weak like your father's, so you'd kill me. And it'd simply be another heart failure, brought on by the sight of your mother's corpse. Do you want to know how I knew? Monday in civics, Miss Haskell told you about the duties of the police. But Miss Haskell also told me you were always at least a month ahead in your studies. Two weeks before your stepfather died, you read that assignment in your school book. And then and there, you decided how to kill them both. The only thing I don't understand is why. You'll never understand, Mr. Levine. No. No, it's you who doesn't understand. To snuff out a life like that, it means nothing to you. You frightened, shocked him into dying. It was bad enough when it was only her. Don't do this, don't do that. When she had to marry him, and there were two of them watching me all the time, saying, no, no, no. That's all they ever said. The only time I ever had some peace was, was when I was at my grandmother's. Is that why? That this useless, half-begun thing could kill and kill. Do you know what's going to happen to you? They won't execute you because you're too young. They'll judge you insane and they'll lock you away. 
And there'll be guards and matrons there to say, don't do this and don't do that. A million, million times more than you can imagine. And they'll keep you locked away in a little room forever and ever. And they'll let you do nothing you want to do. Nothing. There's nothing you can do to me now. And I won't drink the poison you fed your mother. And your bag of tricks won't work. Not now. You see, I know, Amy. I know. Without even seeing your mother's body, I know. And there'll be a suicide confession forged somewhere, won't there? I know, Amy. I know. I'm going to phone the precinct now, and they'll come and get you. And you'll be locked away in that tiny room forever and ever and ever. <laughs> You see, I was right, wasn't I, Amy? I know everything. There's your poor mother's body there on the bed. She looks sad, but not to you, I suppose. And there's the suicide note. See, I know everything, Amy. Everything. Stay away from me! Stay away from me! Why are you standing out there on the windowsill, Amy? Won't you catch a cold? Huh? They'll lock you away, Amy, in a tiny, tiny room. No, they won't. No! Yes. I know what I've done. I made it end that way. She never understood death. So it was possible for her to throw herself into it. The parents began the child, and the child ends the parents. Tonight's presentation of Donald Westlake's The Sound of Murder. You heard Tony Jay as Abraham Levine, Sean Hewitt as Jack Crawley, and Linda Stewart as Amy Thornbridge Walker. Others in the cast were Sheila Holliday and Beryl Gordon. The Sound of Murder was adapted and produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael McCabe.